Welcome to the third lecture in our third week of the course analysis of a complex mind. Today we'll learn about the complex exponential function. We started talking about this function at the end of last class. We discovered that the function f of z defined by e to the x times cosine y plus i times e to the x sine y is an entire function, where z is x plus i y and e to the x cosine y and sine y are just the regular real value functions that we know from calculus. Let's look at some of the properties of this function. Suppose, for example, that y is equal to zero. So this y right here is equal to zero, while cosine of zero is equal to one. And so this y would also be equal to zero, but sine of zero is equal to zero. So in that case, this function would simplify with e to the x times one plus i e to the x times zero. But that's just e to the x because this whole last term gets canceled out by the zero. So when y is equal to zero, then f of z is simply e to the x. In other words, the function f agrees with our regular exponential function if you plug in something real that doesn't have an imaginary part. Another thing to notice is that we could rewrite f of z a little bit. We can factor out the e to the x term right here and are left with e to the x times parentheses cosine y plus i sine y. But cosine y plus i sine y, we found an abbreviation for. We called that e to the i y, even though we weren't quite sure why we called it e to the i y. It was an abbreviation at the time. But now that we're looking at this, e to the x times e to the i y, we would like to think of this as e to the x plus i y, because the rules for our regular real value exponential function would indeed allow us to combine these two exponents. We haven't proven any such thing right now, but this is a reasonable thought to have, and that looks like e to the z, whatever e to the z might be. So with these thoughts in mind, we actually define the complex exponential function e to the z exactly like that. It's also sometimes denoted x plus z, and it's defined by e to the z is e to the x times e to the i y, where z is x plus i y, and e to the i y is still shorthand for cosine y plus i sine y. This is a complex exponential function, and we'll explore it in today's lecture. Again, as a reminder, e to the z is e to the x times e to the i y. What is the length of e to the z? So how far is e to the z from the origin? Well, the absolute value of e to the z can be found by simply taking the absolute value of e to the x times e to the i y. And we know the absolute value of the product of two complex numbers is the product of the absolute value, so norm of e to the x, norm of e to the i y. But e to the i y, remember what that really is? e to the i y is short for cosine y plus i sine y, and it is simply a number on the circle of radius one such that the angle formed with a positive real axis is y. This is e to the i y, which was cosine y plus i sine y. All numbers of this form have distance one from the origin because they're on the circle of radius one. So the norm of e to the i y is one just by how this number e to the i y is defined. The norm of e to the x, e to the x is our real value the exponential function. Remember what that looks like? e to the x looks like this. This is the regular exponential function. It's always above the x axis. It's always positive. It can never be negative. So the norm of e to the x is simply e to the x. What's the argument of e to the z? Now that we know how far e to the z is from the origin, you would like to know what angle is a form with a positive real axis. What's the argument of e to the x times e to the i y? What is e to the x times e to the i y? That's a number in polar form, where this is its length or radius. But for a number in polar form, radius times e to the i something, the something used to the angle that it forms with a positive real axis. So the angle this number forms with a positive real axis is y. Truthfully speaking, I should have written here plus 2 pi k, where k is any integer. So the way you should read this equation is an argument of e to the z is y. What is e to the z plus 2 pi i? So suppose you add 2 pi i to your z and then stick that into the exponential function. Well, since 2 pi i is purely imaginary, that means you're really adding that to the imaginary part of z. So it's the same as e to the x times e to the i y plus 2 pi, adding the 2 pi to the imaginary part of z. But e to the i theta is a function that is periodic with period 2 pi, because we're looking at the angle that is formed with a positive real axis, and it just starts repeating after 2 pi. So e to the i y plus 2 pi is the same as e to the i y. So that this simplifies to the e to the x times e to the i y, which is e to the z. So the function e to the z is periodic, and the period is 2 pi i. When you add 2 pi i to z, the exponential function remains the same. Finally, we would like to establish some properties that are similar to the ones that we have for the real value of exponential function. We would hope that e to the z plus w is e to the z times e to the w. Let's check that this holds with our definition of e to the z, which is up here. What is e to the z plus w? We'll write z as x plus iy and w as u plus id and plug that in. So e to the z plus w becomes e to the x plus iy plus u plus id. Let's reorganize and collect the real parts and collect the imaginary parts because we'll need those to apply the definition of our exponential function. The real part of the sum in the exponent is x plus u and the imaginary part is y plus v. Now we know e to this complex number is e to the real part, so e to the x plus u, times e to the i times the imaginary part, so e to the i times y plus v. That's just by definition of the exponential function. e to the x plus u, now we're talking all real values. x is real, u is real, and e is our regular real value exponential function, so the rules apply. This is e to the x times e to the u. e to the i, y plus v, we proved that that equals e to the i, y times e to the i, v. We use the addition theorems for sine and cosine functions. And now we just reorganize things again. We collect e to the x and e to the i, y, and then e to the u, and e to the i, v. Since it's a product of complex numbers and multiplication is commutative, we can just reorganize things. But e to the x times e to the i, y, that's simply e to the z. And e to the u, e to the i, v, is e to the w. And we established, indeed, that the same rule holds for complex values as it does for real values. What is 1 over e to the z? Well, I claim this e to the negative z. And the reason is that when I look at e to the z times e to the negative z, by the rule we just established, we can simply add the two exponents. So that's e to the z plus negative z, so z minus z. But z minus z is 0, and e to the 0 is 1. So e to the z times e to the minus z is 1. Now, if we divide both sides of this equation by e to the z, we find that e to the minus z is 1 over e to the z. E to the z is an entire function. We already showed this. That's what set us off and why we defined this function. What's the derivative? An entire function has a derivative. Remember that the way the function e to the z is defined, its real part is e to the x times cosine y, and its imaginary part is e to the x times sine y. Again, we can find these partial derivatives that we learned about during the last lecture. The partial derivative of u with respect to x means we differentiate e to the x cosine y with respect to x, keeping in mind that y is fixed in a constant. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x cosine y is a constant, so ux is e to the x cosine y. Similarly, bx is e to the x sine y. Uy, we now keep x constant, so e to the x is a constant, we define the derivative of cosine y, which is minus sine y. And by is e to the x cosine y. 
we learned that for a function that's analytic, its derivative can be found by taking ux plus i vx. So therefore, the derivative of our exponential function is e to the x cosine y, which is ux, plus i times e to the x sine y, that's the vx. But that's e to the z. In other words, the derivative of e to the z is e to the z again, or in symbols, d dz of e to the z is e to the z. Notice that we're using not the partial derivative symbols, which were d dx. We, found, we used that notation for the partial derivatives. This is the complex derivative we use a regular d for that notation. So similarly to the real value exponential function, the derivative of the exponential function is the exponential function itself. Similarly, the derivative of e to the constant times z, how do you find that? This is actually the composition of two functions, the exponential function composed with a function that multiplies z by a. In other words, we need to find the derivative of the outside function times the derivative of the inside function. The inside function is a times z, its derivative is simply a. Therefore, we get a times e to the az by the chain rule for the derivative of e to the az. What is e to the complex conjugate of z? The complex conjugate of z is x minus iy, if z was x plus iy. Therefore, e to the z conjugate equals e to the x times e to the minus iy. But we showed earlier, and we can remember this in the picture, what is e to the minus iy? e to the minus iy means we're taking a negative angle, minus y. We're going to get a number down here. If we reflected that with respect to the x-axis, we would get this number up here. So this is e to the minus iy, and this is e to the iy, and they're complex conjugates of each other, as this picture shows. In other words, e to the minus iy is the conjugate of e to the iy. e to the x is real value. We might just well put a conjugate on top of it, it makes no difference, because real number equals its complex conjugate. So we can extend the conjugation over the entire product, but that's the conjugate of e to the z. In other words, e to the conjugate of z equals the conjugate of e to the z. What is e to the z equal to 1? Well, we need e to the x times e to the iy to be 1. This is a number in polar form. When is a number in polar form equal to 1? Well, its length needs to be 1, its angle needs to be 0, or 2 pi over 4 pi. So in other words, we need e to the x to equal 1, and we need y to be 0, or 2 pi over 4 pi. When is e to the x equal to 1? That's the case when x is equal to 0. So we need x to be 0 and y of the form 2k pi. In other words, we need z to be of the form x plus iy, so 0 plus i times 2k pi. So those are the points where the exponential function takes the value 1. When is e to the z equal to e to the w? We already saw that if z is equal to w plus 2 pi i, then e to the z equals e to the w. But are there other possibilities for e to the z to equal e to the w? Let's find out. If we divide both sides of this equation by e to the w, we know that 1 over e to the w is e to the minus w, so e to the z divided by e to the w becomes e to the z minus w, and that then needs to be equal to e to the w over e to the w, which is 1. When is e to the z minus w equal to 1? Well, that is the case when z minus w is of the form 2 pi i k. In other words, when z is equal to w plus a multiple of 2 pi i. So the cases we observed earlier were the only ways for e to the z to equal e to the w. Let's understand the mapping w equals e to the z. We did this earlier for some other functions. We looked at this as a mapping from the z plane to the w plane, with w being equal to e to the z. For example, let's look at images of horizontal lines. So what's a horizontal line? A horizontal line is of the form x plus i, y, 0, where y, 0 is fixed. So we're fixing the imaginary part and just varying x. For those points x plus i, y, 0, they get mapped to e to the x plus i, y, 0, which is e to the x, e to the i, y, 0. But y, 0 is a fixed number, so this is not going to change. This is fixed. And the only thing that can change is e to the x. And e to the x, if x runs from negative infinity to infinity, e to the x will go from 0 to infinity. It will never take the value 0, but anything as close to 0 as possible. And e to the i, y is a fixed angle from the origin. Let's look at some examples. For example, this red dotted line right there. What is its image? It's the line where y0 is equal to pi. What is e to the i pi? e to the i pi is equal to negative 1, forming an angle of pi with a positive real axis. In other words, all these numbers, e to the x times e to the i, y0, lie in the negative real axis. So the image of the red dotted line right here is the negative real axis, except in the origin. Let's look at the green line next. What is its image? In my picture, it looks like the imaginary part is a little bit bigger than pi over 2. This angle here is just a little bit bigger than pi over 2. E to the i, y, 0 is a point on the unit circle whose radius forms the angle y, 0 with a positive real axis, and therefore the image of the green line is this green line right here. Let's look at the turquoise line. It looks like its imaginary part is around pi over 4. So the image is going to be this turquoise line right there. How about the yellow line? The yellow line up here has an imaginary part just a little bit bigger than pi. So we're looking at this angle right here, and therefore the image of the yellow line is this radial segment down here. You notice that I drew another yellow line in the z-plane, a little bit above minus i pi. And indeed, this reflects that the exponential function is periodic with periods 2 pi i. This second yellow line has distance 2 pi i from the other yellow line. In other words, its image is the same as the image of the other yellow line. So these two yellow lines both get mapped to the radial segment over in the w-plane. Finally, there's a purple line here, and you can check that it gets mapped to something like this purple line over here. What are the images of vertical lines? A vertical line is of the form x0 plus iy, where now x0 is fixed. So the real part is fixed and the imaginary part varies. Those points get mapped to e to the x0 plus iy, which is e to the x0 times e to the iy. And so now this number is fixed. The distance from the origin is fixed for all these images, and the angle varies. In other words, for a fixed line that's vertical, its image is a circle. For example, the yellow line that is on the imaginary axis, so x0 will be 0, it's mapped to e to the 0, which is 1 times e to the iy. But e to the iy, if y is allowed to vary from negative infinity to infinity, it's mapped to the circle, and the circle is mapped over and over and over again because this keeps repeating. There's 0 here, and say 2 pi i is right here, and this little short segment already gets mapped to the full unit circle, and afterwards we just keep repeating. 
Similarly, the red dotted line gets mapped to e to the x0 times e to the iy, because x0 is a little bigger than 0, so e to the x0 is bigger than 1, so it gets mapped to a circle whose radius is bigger than the previous one. And if we move over to the green line, its radius is going to be even bigger than the one of the red circle. Similarly, if I go to negative x0s, e to the something negative is going to be a number less than 1. It's still positive, but a number less than 1. So these radii are going to be less than 1, and the circles are going to be sitting inside the unit circle. Putting it all together, we can actually figure out what the image of a vertical strip is. Suppose we look at the set of all z whose real part is between 0 and 1. So here's 1, and there's 0, and this is my vertical strip S. What is its image? We already saw that the yellow line, which is on the imaginary axis, gets mapped to the unit circle. The green line, for which I said the real part is equal to 1, gets mapped to the circle of radius E. In other words, the strip from 0 to 1 gets mapped to this annulus between the circles of radius 1 and of radius E. If I draw a horizontal line to this picture in addition, the one that I drew is maybe at pi over 4, then I cut out a portion of that annulus. So for example, this turquoise portion here of the strip gets matched to this turquoise portion of the annulus. These kinds of features help you understand what the exponential function does practically. Here's a few final questions. When is e to the z equal to 0? Well, let's find out. e to the z is equal to 0 when e to the x times e to the iy is 0. We know e to the iy, those are all numbers of the circle of radius 1, they can never be 0. One is a product of two numbers 0, but one of the factors has to be 0. The second one can't be 0, so it has to be the first one. So we need e to the x to be 0. But remember what e to the x looks like? e to the x looks like this. It never crosses the x-axis. It's never equal to 0. In other words, e to the z can never take the value 0. Just like a real value exponential function, it never takes the value 0. Let's go a little bit further. Suppose I'm giving you a point in the complex plane, not the origin, but any other point. Then can I find a w such that e to the w is equal to that point z? Let's write z in polar form as absolute value of z times e to that theta. And let's write w in Cartesian form, because that works best for this problem. So let's write w as u plus iv. Then e to the w being e to the z is the same as e to the u times e to the iv, which is e to the w, being equal to absolute value of z e to the i theta, which is simply z. And this was e to the w. Now these are two numbers in polar form. When are two complex numbers in polar form the same? Well, they would have to agree in their distance from the origin, so e to the u would have to be the absolute value of z, and then their angles have to agree modulo 2 pi. So e to the iv would have to be e to the i theta. In other words, when is e to the u equal to the absolute value of z? This is all real value now. That's the case when u is a natural logarithm of the absolute value of z. And when is e to the iv the same as e to the i theta? Well, b and theta can only differ by a modulo 2 pi. In other words, w, just u plus iv, has to be of the form natural log of z, that's my u, plus i times an argument of z, which is what theta is. You just saw the basic ideas of how to define a complex logarithm. You see there's an issue already with the argument being here. The argument function is a multi-value function, and we have to decide how to pick the argument so that we could hopefully make a logarithm function an analytic function, and indeed that is possible.